from Byron, Mississippi, it's Lakeshore Church. Um, amazing verse. Uh, here's what it says. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground. First time that's mentioned in the Bible, by the way. Since you were taken from it. For you are dust and you will return to dust. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord. Uh, you know my heart. My desire is to bring glory and honor to you. So God, would you guide my words, guide my thoughts. Most of all, Holy Spirit, you have full reign and dominion to this room. And all the social media, any way this, these thoughts are, are uh, broadcast, I pray, God, your spirit would be upon it. Anoint it, we pray. And then, God, each one of us would walk in obedience to what we hear and realize, Lord, today we live in horror. But our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. So bless, we pray, and we'll be careful to give you the praise for we ask and pray it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Here's your list. Uh, the list has gotten long. There's just a couple left. Um, you can see there. Um, they're out there for you on the worldwide. They're on our Facebook page. You can find them. We can produce them for you. Uh, if you miss one, go back. It's really taken on a um, uh, really a nature all its own. Even some of this I did not see. I started putting them together. Uh, some of them were pretty, uh, pretty out there, and then some of them, it's just amazing. So you see them there, and like I said, there's two more. Today, uh, I'm dealing with death, and that seems so drab. Uh, when, we think, when I think about the world that we live in today, um, every one of us will experience death. As much as man has created and invented and we've come up with all this, now, there's not one person that's ever cheated death. Death was born, listen to me very carefully, death was born because of what Adam and Eve did. And the reason I say that and say listen to me is because people struggle with that. There are people that apply death to God. That why, if God loves us, then why do people die? And many times what happens is we're really confused about it because God didn't create death, sin did. All right? It was all about it. They were all about life. I, I'm just fascinated with they didn't have one single negative thing in the creation before sin. They didn't have another side. <laughs> there, there was, it was amazing. Think about Adam and Eve today and their perfection of where they were. It was amazing. And the enemy, the serpent, shows up in that form, and he says that there's another side. There's something that God left out. And, and not really a lie because there was. He didn't leave it out. He told them, don't do this. He didn't tell them the ramifications of it. He didn't tell them their eyes would be open. He didn't tell them you'd be naked. He didn't say anything about good and evil. He just said, don't do this. Mm. So therefore, the fallout, that was last time. And life as they knew it changed. And death was birthed. And that death has been passed down to all man. Somebody said it best. The mortality rate of humanity is 100%. Nobody's going to cheat it. If there was possibility of cheating it and getting by it, somebody would have already figured it out. There's no doubt about it. Huh. The Bible says some unique things about death. First in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it says it's an appointment. You and I have an appointment with death. Uh, we, we use that word a lot with scheduling and things like that, but we have an appointment. God knows right now, each one of us, the day we'll leave this world and, and step out into eternity. Wow. It's also about action. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7, it says, And the dust returns to the earth as it once was, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. In other words, when death takes, takes place, there's some active things that are going to happen. There are religions out there, and I do think I'm called somewhat to take a stand publicly. There are religions that have been broadcast out there that you're going to cease to exist when you take your last breath. That's not what that says. That says we're going to leave this place. Some of us, some of us is going to go, some part of me is going to go back to the dust, but other parts going to live forever. Very plain. Each one of us is going to live forever. We already established that in the Genesis uh, issues. And then the last thing is, and there's a lot of people about being afraid. If, if I asked for a show of hands, you had to be truthful today. Probably half the hands that go up in this room are people that are afraid to die. You know, I don't know what it's like. I preached one time on heaven, and I had a lady in the church that came up to me and said, you were preaching so what today. I wonder if the bus came by, would you get on it? And I said, I don't think the bus is up to me whether I get on it or not. It's an appointment, and there's coming in the day, there's coming a day, well, I will, it will be my last day. And every one of us here, I'm not here to scare you. But should I be afraid? If you don't know Christ, you should be, you know, because he's eternal life. But I know Christ today, and, you know, I can get pretty pumped up about it. I'm going to mention it two or three times today. But Jesus' words, should I be afraid? In Matthew 10, 28, 
He said, don't, don't fear those who kill the body but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him who's able to destroy both soul and body in hell. If we don't take God at his offer, listen to me, that same God, that same loving, graceful God will say, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, for I never knew you. Wow. It's amazing. I don't know if you're familiar with the name Margaret Mitchell. That's going to hurt my mother when she hears this. She watches. And, uh, she's the one who authored Gone with the Wind. Uh, I, I've, I've seen a little bit of Gone with the Wind, but not all of it. And, and my desire when it comes to Gone with the Wind is not to watch it. Okay, I just want you to know that. <laughs> you thought I was going to say something else, didn't you? One of my bucket list things is to sit and watch Gone with the Wind. I've seen enough of it. It didn't do much for me, even though it's, it's where I herald from. Margaret Mitchell, I found this just surfing, and I thought, this fits it when they talk about death and other things. This is what she said. She said, death, taxes, and childbirth. There's never any convenient time for any of them. Now, if you could afford, if you're a parent here today and you could afford when you, raised, when you had your child, would you raise your hand? That's what I thought. The first service, I heard some, somebody that wasn't really paying attention, they got their hand halfway up and they realized what the question was. You never can afford them. You, you can't. How about taxes? It's April. How'd that treat you? Huh? I mean, I, get, I, I can have an out-of-body experience when I think about paying taxes. I mean, I, I get beside myself. I can talk to myself. And self-answers. We have a conversation when it comes to taxes. What about death? It never, never comes at a convenient time. I thought about somebody. We'll have his memorial service Tuesday. But Charles Brazier went to be with the Lord. And the first thought I had is he went to be with the Lord and, and Miss Judy. <laughs> That's what I thought. Uh, I got to be transparent, and, and, and if the family's here, I apologize, but this is said out of love. But I thought, I wonder how long he was there before Miss Judy told him to do something. <laughs> and it wasn't that she was bossy. That was just the way, and he loved it too. Now, he's one of those that just eat it up. I mean, he was a gentle giant, and uh, looking forward to seeing him again. But I, I think about those things. Think about it. Death, taxes, and childhood, they, they, it's never convenient. Death, I, I don't know if it's ever convenient. And it's surely not a bus we come by and get on, but we, we trust the Lord. <laughs> we do. Uh, all three of them are so true. Life was totally different. We, you got to get that. Totally different for Adam and Eve. They're the only ones that know what it was like before. We'll mention that. Radically different. And I want to talk about that 180 degrees different this morning. The horror. The horror of going from life to death. I've said that a lot in, in this sermon that, that they, had, had, it, they had some things no one else has ever had. They lived in a place with no issues. There's not a person on the sound of my voice that, that, that lives a life with no issues. There's probably some of you here that could be president of the club. You've got so many issues. We have issues. Jesus said we would have issues and trouble in our life. They had no issues. Listen to this. Their life, in my opinion, was light and li livable. <laughs> Man, it's a pretty good gig. The scripture even says that before sin, they just reached over to the tree and got them something to eat. They didn't even have to bend over. They didn't have to take a hoe to the ground. They didn't have to bust the ground up. They didn't have to fertilize it. They didn't have to put seeds in the ground. I wonder if that's where back trouble started right there is in the garden after they sinned because they had to hoe the garden all the time. They had no issues. They had calm and surreal and balanced life. They had no concept of what you and I deal with. They had a picture of time. You know what I found in study? There's not one place. I don't even think anybody ever talked about it. I wonder how long they were in the garden. There's not a night and day thing here. We have the night and days of creation, but there's not an amount of time. We don't know exactly well, how long this went on, but they knew they had a period of time, I guarantee you. They knew what perfection was, and you and I have never known that. Never have this side of glory. We never will until we get to heaven. They had nothing but peace. So they had no issues. Another thing I've said a lot in these sermons is they had total innocence. They had no history. They had no past. <laughs> oh, wow. Isn't that great? Huh? I mean, Eve didn't have any former boyfriends. Adam didn't have a mother-in-law. I mean, there's a lot of things. I mean, there's some good stuff. Neither one of them had belly buttons. I mean, it's a pretty good gig. Some of you are slow, but you're worth waiting on, okay? They were, they were totally innocent. They had no views of others. They had no problems. They had no notions. They have no preconceived notions or none of that stuff. It's amazing. They were just right. <laughs> just right. Huh? Man, I love when I eat something and, and, and I do, and I go, man, that was just right. 
But you know I thought about for this sermon? They were just right with God too. I don't know, and I hope you get this. I hope you receive it because there's a lot of people that don't understand. I don't think they understand that you can be right with God. Huh? They took it up with the vice president, by the way. He talked about talking to God, and God spoke to him and speaks to him, and people freaked out in the media about it. Let me tell you something. God prepared something that you can be right with God. You can be just right with God. Nothing between your soul and your Savior. I think one of the best feelings in the world, pick up God's Word and uh, spend time with God and know there's nothing between my soul and my Savior. (laughs) Just right with God. No chasing, no dogging, no convicting. Wow, good stuff. It is. But then something happened. I defined it for the sermon. It all changed. You know, and I, I, I teach this in marriage stuff. I teach this in, oh, you, you should never say always, never, you should never say always, never say never. You know, you never clean up after yourself. Well, if he did it one time, then you can't say never. You always talk like that. Well, if he talked some di- different way, you can't say always and never. But let me say, when, I, when I'm bold enough to say it all changed, not 95%, not 99%, it all changed when Adam and Eve sinned. It all changed. Pandora's box was open. You've heard that saying before. I've used that my whole life. I don't even know when I started using it. I used it in sermons a lot. But I thought, you know, I never really have studied that. Let me go look. I found out, you know what Pandora is? That's not that radio thing, you know, you turn on your, t- you know, it's not that app. You know who Pandora is? Pandora comes out of Greek mythology. Huh. And it's really unique. The reason I'm including this one, I can't believe my pastor is talking about Greek mythology up here in the pulpit. But it's pretty unique. Pandora, the gods gave her a box of evil. Hmm. Pandora in Greek mythology, listen to this now, some 700 BC, 700 years before Christ, Pandora was considered the first woman. Is is it just me as anybody else? Does that sound sort of familiar? Does that sound sort of familiar that people take God things and we warp them up a little bit? (laughs) You know? I love that word. I don't think it's correct English, but I love using it. We warp it up. You know, we just mess it all up and all of a sudden it becomes something. Does it sound familiar to the first woman who evil became her? And that's where that phrase comes is that Pandora would open her box and she would pour out evil on other people. That's the Greek mythology. So my point here is this, is that it all changed. Pandora's box was open spiritually. Now, don't go too far with this mythology stuff. That's, some of that stuff is, you're wasting time to read it, in my opinion. But anyway, not one thing stayed the same in creation. Not one. It all changed. Death was born. Hurts were born. Pain was born. Sin messed it all up. I've already alluded to it, but how horrible it must have been. The horror of horrors is Adam and Eve knew what it was like before you ever been there you ever been right with God serving God and everything's great and something happened you went your weary way the scripture says things is better for man not to want known the way of righteousness than after you've known it to go back the latter end is worse than the beginning you know what I think about that I think that you know what it's like to be right with God and you know you're not and it's a miserable state you say brother how can you be so emphatic because I've been there I know what it's like not to be right with him when you need to be right and you know what right means and feels like. Huh, Adam and Eve knew what it was like. They lived in perfection and now because they were duped into it and they sinned against God, now they were banished from that perfection. Wow. So there's where we are. I found this verse in Psalm 51, 5 that really sums it up. It says, indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. The point being in this horror, you and I have never known what Adam and Eve knew. We've never known that perfection. The best we can be is right with God in a sinful world. The best I can be is right with God with a sinful nature. The best I can be is right with God and have to deal with sin and issues in my life. That's the best I can be this side of glory. And I'm not talking about defeating that. I'm talking about living in that victory. You can be victorious over sin. You can live a life that's righteous before the Lord. But we will always know what all these natures in this horrible world that we live in is like until we get to heaven. That's the horror. But I want to talk about hope for a few minutes. When I think about hope, I think about from death to life, from being lost to a child of God. Hmm. All of us need to be reminded, be reminded that we've all been lost. I think one of the indictments on the church, and I read stuff like this all the time, how is it that we've gotten so right with God that we've forgotten about our lostness? 
Some people, my pastor used to say they got over being saved. <laughs> You know, we we forgot how lost we were and how redeemed we are. And and sometimes people that come down the same path that we come down, we don't extend them the same grace that we're glad was extended to us before we knew Christ. From lost to the child of God. Romans 3.23 is one of those verses we'll preach on in the coming weeks. But it says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Hmm. We are all lost. Same plight, same predicament. That's the reason I think church work works so well if if it's healthy. There shouldn't be a person in this church, no matter if you're a scholar, there shouldn't be a person in this church that forgets where they came from. Thank you, Brother John. Hmm? We shouldn't forget where we came from. I should never thumb down. I should never throw my nose at somebody or put my foot on somebody else because they're not where I think they ought to be. For except for the grace of God, it could be me. People talk about judging. You shouldn't judge. Let me tell you what I know about judging. You ready? The word of God says the same measure you judge others, you yourself be judged. If I was a lost person today, knowing what I know in righteousness, I hope you would judge me as lost and pray for me, intercede for me, witness for me, witness to me, interact with me because I need the Jesus you have. That's stuff we come up with. We've let the world get a lot further in the church than they ever should have. Oh, same plight, same predicament. Luke chapter 19 verse 10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. The reason Jesus came to this earth was to pay sin's debt so that you and, you and I could be redeemed. We need to be reminded of that. I always like to remind people the second reason he came, the reason it was 33 and a third years, and he had those three and a half years, he showed us how to live. He showed us how to deal with antagonists. He showed us how to deal with people closest to him. He showed us how to deal with people that hated him. He showed us how to live the Christian life. Hmm, do like Jesus did. What would Jesus do? That's the reason that bracelet's still around today, decades later. Then John chapter 8, verse 21 through 24. I enjoyed reading for this sermon. There's two passages in this sermon that I don't know I've ever really highlighted. Uh, I, I don't know. I might be going through this true. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm just a little over a year from being 60 years old. I have to say that on a daily basis, weekly basis to get used to the idea. All right? But I, I'm not doing a lot of reminiscing lately with sermons. But think about this one. So then he said to them again, I'm going away. You, you will look for me and you will die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. So the Jews said again, we won't kill, he won't kill himself, will he? Since he said, where I'm going, you cannot come. You are from below, he told them. I am from above. You are of this world and I'm not of this world. In the last verse, therefore I told you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. You and I, because of sin, we're going to die. We've already established that. The understanding, the reason I chose to put this here, is we need, a fi- we need an understanding today, a finality, if you will, that we're all sinners. And the only difference between anybody in this room is whether they've been converted or not. And then conversion puts us on another track. So I should never look down at someone. I mean, God's been reminding us, we're going to talk about service at the end, but... God's been reminding me many times we look and somebody's just way out there or something and, and it can boil us when we see some of the things going on. But we need to be reminded the only difference between us and them is Jesus Christ. Now there's growth in our life and those types of things, but we're all the same. We're all the same in some progression or some pattern or path. It's either lost or we're a child of God. What does that look like? Hmm. I don't know if you've thought about the words to amazing grace lately. I, I found it, but I was just I, riding along a couple of days ago and amazing grace came on and, and um, I was listening to the lyrics. And I went, man, that's too good not to put in my sermon. It said, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That sort of takes care of ego, doesn't it? <laughs> Who did God save? He saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. But now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Every one of us were lost. The only difference is whether we've been found or not. Every one of us were blind. The only difference is whether we've been we see it and have experienced it. We're all lost. Then the second thing, and uh, from from death to life, the hope that we have is to lay hold on eternal life. First Timothy chapter six verse twelve, and in the King James it says this. It says, fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Lay hold. Grab a hold of that thing. 
you know, not to, not to spend a lot of time, but I, I truly believe that possession is everything. And I've studied out nine-tenths of the law and where that came from and how we use those types of things, and people have surely used it legally. But I do believe possession is everything. And let me tell you what possession means to you. I guarantee you something that you possess that's valuable to you. Maybe it was a parent left it to you, an inheritance, a grandparent. It was something that was given to you. Maybe it's a cherished item that you have, and I have some of those. Well, you know what I know about cherished things, possessions that we really, truly love? They're not out there on the coffee table for everybody to look at. They're in the corner of the closet. They're in the safe deposit box down at the bank. Now most of us have safes of some sort at our house. And I like the guy that's got a safe that holds 40 guns, and he's got it bolted down to the concrete in his house. I'm pretty comfortable with the idea that if you've got a gun safe that big, he's not going to tote it out of your house, all right? Had to take the door facing to get, out, get it in the house. It's, it's probably pretty safe. But where do we put it? It's not out there for everybody to look at. Because there's something innate with us. Listen to me. When it's something of value, we protect it. Are you laying hold to eternal life? If somebody comes to get something that's of value to you, you're going to squeeze it, squeeze it, hold on to it. You can't take it away from me. It's mine. Are you laying hold of eternal life? Somehow I think we've dumbed it down to the point people just think, well, it's just going to be the next thing. See, I think if you're laying hold to eternal life, and if it's a possession and something that has your attention and it's something you think about every day, it will affect that day that you're thinking about it. Hmm. Laying hold of it. I believe this. What you hold in your heart and hope. What you hold is it, is your heart and hope. Lay hold on it. And the last one that goes right along with that is when I think about the death to life and the hope that we have, we're going to leave this chaos one day. The older I get, I've already alluded to it, the more I think of heaven. I've already mentioned Brother Charles. And I think about the dozens and dozens of people that, that have left us just since we've been here. I think about a stepdad that took on a wife and five kids. I was the fifth one. Never called me a stepchild. And I can't wait to see him one day in heaven and stroll over heaven with him. Got a brother that passed away when he was 16. I was 12. That was one of the hardest things I've ever been through in my life. was the hardest thing when I was 12. And for many years after that, trying to put that in context in my life, dozens and dozens of people, maybe a couple of hundred, two or three hundred people that I've stood over and said the last words. I miss them even today. I reminisced over some of those folks. I can't remember what I'm supposed to do tomorrow, but I have a memory. I can tell you what went on when I was a teenager. I'm glad God gave me that. Some of you are dreadfully messed up, okay? <laughs> but I catch myself thinking about heaven more and more every day. I got a pastor that poured into me when I didn't deserve it. I can't wait to see Roman Miller. The only thing I'm going to not let him do is shake my hand. He, he dislocates my shoulder. I ain't telling what he's going to do in heaven because he hurt me when he was over here. On and on I could go with the people. I didn't want to get into people here because somebody would be offended that you left my mom and dad and my husband and wife somebody out. But so many I've thought about. I thought about the verse in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9, where it says, But as it is written, eyes not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man <clears throat> the things which God has prepared for them that love him. I've heard this many times. I have a family member that looked across the den at me just a few weeks back and said these words to me, why hasn't Jesus come to get me yet? I've heard that many times in ministry. People on their deathbed, they're going through the troubles of a life and diagnosis and issues in the latter days of life. Make you think about, and I want to encourage you as a pastor today, that one day in Jesus Christ, we're going to leave this crazy, chaotic world. Huh. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Not because of who I am, but because of who he is. And God loved me when I was unlovable. And he paid sin's debt, not that I would be saved, that I might be saved. He left the choice up to me, and he left the choice up to you. Man, I think about those kind of things. One day leaving this chaos. I want to remind you folks. We put a lot of stock in this life, but one day everything that you run after in this life, you're going to leave behind. I heard this years ago in my life, the only thing that I will ever take to, with me to heaven is someone else. Everything else I'm going to leave behind. The only thing, the only investment, the only thing that, that I can make an impact in heaven is someone else. 
And we run after things that don't amount to anything. Is there anything wrong with it? No, not in its own way. But we need to make sure we prioritize it, folks. We need to make sure that we're doing that. Man, I love this passage. I don't know if I've ever used this. But in Isaiah chapter 25, verses 7 through 9, it says, On this mountain he will swallow up the burial shroud, the shroud over all the peoples, the sheet covering all the nations. And when he has swallowed up death once and for all, the Lord God will wipe away the tears from every face and remove his people's disgrace from the whole earth, for the Lord has spoken. On that day it will be said, Look, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he has done what? Saved us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let's rejoice and be glad in his salvation. <laughs> I'm glad to report to you today there's a lot of horrible things going on in the world, but hope springs eternal. Hmm. When all that mess in the garden turned into horror of horrors, down through the corridors of time, hope, hope because of Jesus Christ. Last week I shared a verse that I want to reiterate today. It's in Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. It says this, on that day it will be said, look, excuse me, he will wipe away every tears from their eye. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. Look at it again. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. So today as we deal with it, the mortality rate's 100%. One day, death will be no more. There's always a tomorrow, a hope of tomorrow for the child of God. Uh, I, can, I can look around, three or four people have already gone through my mind today. Some have been going through things for years. Some it's right off the press. There's hurts. There's unknowns. There's question marks of life, what tomorrow holds. I just want to remind you, I can say with, with emphasis, I can be emphatic. I cannot without fear if I don't have to back up one bit to tell you. If you know Jesus Christ, there's always a tomorrow for the child of God. <laughs> if you don't, all bets are off. The best you can hope for is a good day today. And uh, our three crosses, that's our mission statement. I believe I'm called today to present the gospel in such a way that somebody knows Christ as their Savior. If you know Christ as your Savior, you sh he should be Lord of your life. That's the cross of separation. And I believe every person has a cross to bear. I believe every one of us have giftedness. Every one of us have opportunities. Every one of us have talents. God expects us to carry a cross that brings glory and honor to him. If anyone will come after me, the cross wall verse, let him deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. And today I think the church, we like, it's okay with salvation. That's heaven and hell stuff. I want that salvation cross. And I'm okay with serving, but what about that separation cross? I don't know if I want to do that. But you know, death is a part of every one of them. The cross itself is about death. I'm dying. I'm dying to self. I'm dying to Jay. I'm dying to my passions. I'm dying to my desires. I'm dying to my habits. I'm dying to my lifestyles. I'm dying to what Jay wants. And Christ <laughs> lives in me.